students can pursue their interests in deep time, supported by minimal yet viable curriculum. Thanks for being with us today, Gareth. Thank you. Have at it. Okay. All right, everyone should be seeing that, right? Is that good? Okay, excellent. So uh, thank you to the design interest group of the NAEA. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and share uh, these ideas with you. Um, I am Gareth Height, and I want to note at the outset that this title, um, Lingering at the Point of Wonder, is a title that I'm borrowing. I am a collector of words and phrases, and this phrase was spoken by a classmate of mine at um, Bard College's Institute for Writing and Thinking in a workshop uh, I was in in the early 2000s. She, um, uh, this woman was an adjunct professor at Barnard, and she was describing the way that informal types of writing, like free writing, give students the, uh, the, uh, the license to sort of just uh, abide within um, areas of inquiry without ever having to really like get to a right answer and I heard her say it as lingering at the point of wonder and I collected that because I think it speaks to more than just writing. So I want to take you back in time uh, to March, March 13th exactly, because that would have been when most schools in the United States shut down and it was uh, the beginning of our quarantine. But I also see it as an inciting incident for education because it ushers in, at least for education, I think, um, a, a sort of dragging us into the 21st century, finally. Um, there's numerous reasons for why I think that education took so long to get here. That's not the focus of my speech this evening. But COVID also does something else unexpected. It warps time because absent schedules and rush hours and timetables, we are spinning endlessly, almost gloriously in a pool of time. And when we finally go back to our emergency online school, we realize something, right? We can't possibly do everything that we were doing in our classrooms. We're moving through time differently. But COVID also made us aware that our curricula were bloated. We thought that with better technology, we'd get better at maintaining regularity and precision like this, the most precise timepiece in the uh, known universe. But it turns out that a lot of what we were doing was simply spending others' time in wasteful ways. So I sort of want to listen to that again. We're spending others' time in wasteful ways. I'm going to go all English teacher on you here because that's what I am. And I want to talk about metaphors and how our language defines our reality. So let's take a look at this issue of time, right? We say time is money. We say, how are you spending your time? We might even say that Time is running out. And of course, if you've been in the classroom, this might be familiar to you, right? The question I'd like to pose is like, what does all of this tell us about this abstract thing that we call time, right? We're comparing it to some other thing. This, in a sense, the, the concept of things that are um, uh, limited resources, right? And so that notion, if we take that notion of the metaphor, it really bleeds into our classroom because that's how we're experiencing time. I mean, aside from performance and points, time is the primary thing that we measure in our classrooms, right? And as the philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer noted, to measure time in this way creates the illusion of a succession of nows emanating from the future and receding into the past, and that this sort of measuring requires that we separate time from its contents. And in doing so, we create empty time. And so the work of the teacher and the classroom has been to fill that time. So we create pacing guides, ridiculously complex curriculum maps. We parse out the lesson into different sections where we decide to occupy time with words and facts and trivialities. And then we rush, we push, we try to use time to achieve checkpoints, benchmarks, and move on immediately, leaving the past, anticipating the future, but rarely in the now. We plan, shape, direct, channel, and push time. And all of this because we feel that it's the most efficient way to move students through the fields of knowledge that we have decided should be explored. I mean, 
shouldn't we be wondering how this hidden curriculum is felt by those whose time we've decided to empty and fill? Shouldn't we be asking to what extent our timely focus on efficiency has overwhelmed our ability to be effective as well as the children in our care? And what would it look like if we were to try to do something different? Well, first we'd have to recognize that we in education have a problem with time, and it's not that we don't have enough of it. It's that we misunderstand how human beings experience time. We force humans to exist within a system of industrial time, a relentless and perpetually running out machine time that is so ingrained into our culture that it's not seen as something that could be otherwise. It simply is, you know, it's the way things are. I mean, come on, how many of us haven't at some point said, this is simply the real world? So think about that. What kind of world is that? For most of us, it's a 52 minute class followed by the next disconnected 52 minute class and the next one and the next one ad infinitum. But we need to think a little bit more because this too is the real world. And this, this child looking through this telescope with the help of his father or uncle or whoever this figure may be looking out into the Milky Way, this is an experience of the world in deep time. It is filled with wonder and awe, and I can't help but think that there's a lot of joy involved here. So the thing is, I can't abide by logical fallacies. I refuse to toe the line if I know that my practice is incongruent with my beliefs. I don't accept the sort of naturalistic fallacy that the way things are is necessarily the way they ought to be. And so I pose questions. Like this one, what if we asked how might we create experiences that allow students to move through time in deeper and profoundly human ways? I say I pose that question. I'm pretty sure every teacher ever has asked that question. What would it look like? What would be the key questions at the core of that question? And is there justification for it beyond just my simple musings here? Well, if we took the advice of Thomas Armstrong in his small tome, Awakening Genius in the Classroom, what would it look like if we could focus our efforts on designing learning experiences that engendered things like wonder and curiosity and sensitivity that were filled with joy and had at their center creativity itself? I mean, this could be pie in the sky, this thinking. I mean, seriously, all these things sound wonderful, but notice that they're also inefficient according to school's industrial time model. They can't be measured normatively, they require a deep devotion of deep time, and perhaps most importantly, they require that the locus of power is no longer held in the hands of the teacher, but the learner is now in charge of their time, learning with us how to best move through time to achieve their learning goals. So what if we did this? What would it require from us? Well, I think there are at least four things, maybe five, that this would require. First, a partnership, as the author Phyllis Wheatley says, with uncertainty and confusion. That is, we need to indulge not in achievement after achievement after achievement, but in the questing space that questions themselves define. We need a willingness to make space for failure on the learner's part as well as on the teacher's part. We need an exploration of questions for which the answers are uncertain and a belief that we exist not in binaries of rights and wrongs, but that we are all engaged in a pursuit of an understanding that brings us closer to the truth. Perhaps also a transformation of learning as a transaction uh, from a transactional event to one more akin to a transcendent event in a subject-centered classroom where we are all in pursuit of what Parker Palmer calls a great thing. In some ways, I think that it would be the most profound confounding of our traditions, but it is not unheard of because the poets have already been there. John Keats called this the state of negative capability. When a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. So probably by now, you might be like, oh, geez, Gareth, uh, you're dreaming, right? Like, who are you to present me with this information? What makes you qualified to talk about time this way? So, okay, 
indulge me here, you're right to question me because while I may talk like one, I am not a time lord. I am also not a designer, but I think and teach my students to think in designerly minded ways. I am, however, someone practiced in the art of lingering, of, as Walt Whitman said, leaning and loafing at my ease. And when I think about that, one of the things that comes to mind, if I were to offer you an example of what this might look like, but I'm sure you have your own examples, is something like this. That when I was a young boy, about 14 or so, I got my first telescope. And I took it and I put it on the deck of our above ground pool and I pointed it out into the night sky, the brightest thing I could see. And I brought that thing into focus and it was Saturn hanging in the dark, infinite blackness of space. And my mouth dropped because I had only ever seen it in drawings and pictures. And it was there so far away and yet so close. And what I experienced, because I can't unsee that now, right? Like this is something that is what, I, what I'm sure other people have called and I'm calling right now, an infinite now for me. So while I may not be that much of an expert in time or art or even anything else, I am, however, someone who abides in inquiry and whose classrooms have been in places where lingering at the point of wonder has been at the forefront, forefront of all that I do. I'm someone whose classrooms are driven by these two questions. Why are things the way they are and how can we make them better? The first question is a traditional question. It's a question of inquiry. We want our students to inquire about the world. We teach them how to do research, how to figure things out, how to make observations and come to conclusions. The second question is one that we don't ask enough. And the second question is really important because it shifts the learner's place within the classroom from one of a consumer to one of an agent of action because it tells them that they can make the world a better place. So let me give you an example of what this looked like in several classes that I've created over the course of my career. So in 1998, it was asked to help create a curriculum that explored the links between performing, static, and the literary arts. So creativity is an act of expression. And we worked with our local art co our college's art museum, the Berman Museum of Art on our sinuses campus, to create a program in close viewing. You may recognize that term, it links to the work of David Perkins. And this was great because it was all about lingering, just like you see the students in these pictures do. And this would come within other units that we developed in my classroom that developed lingering capabilities, like a photography unit and a poetry unit. But it also uh, culminated in taking that, those lingering capabilities and instead of just looking at art, turning to look at things in the real world. And one of my favorite things to look at in the real world is toothbrushes, because there are just so darn many of them. So these are some of my seventh grade students exploring why toothbrushes are the way they are and how companies try to make them better continuously. But we didn't stop with toothbrushes. We wanted to change things. We wanted to take a look at the world around us. So we looked at our school and we started asking questions about why are desks the way they are? Why are our lockers so poorly designed? And then we went and we started to redesign those. We presented to students who had had the class before and they gave us critiques during the middle of our design process. And at the end, we presented to um, people from Knoll Furniture, which is a furniture design company um, a little ways from me here in Pennsylvania. This gentleman was an engineer there and he's giving feedback to these students on their locker design. And then we took it a step further and we worked with the Design Learning Challenge of the Industrial Designer Society of America. And for two years, we entered in, in our second year, in the year 2013, uh, we won that contest by working with students from Philadelphia University's Industrial Design Program and created a, pro a project called Observations to Objects, Inception and the Craft of Design. And that was in 2013. And then for me, things sort of went a little bit dark because I was moved from my classroom, a very comfortable place to the high school and I was asked to teach gifted English. Uh, and I asked, well, what does that look like? And I was told, just make it different. 
And so I did, because one of the first things I did in that first year was I brought in 20 time projects. These are also called genius hour, passion projects, purpose projects, whatever you want to call them. What I did was I took one day a week for a full semester and I gave it to my students and they engaged in purpose-based, passion-propelled, inquiry-centered, self-determined learning. And the results were phenomenal. And then that led me to my own moonshot thinking. And I thought, well, what could I, how could I possibly do this as a full class? And that is how I got to the creation of Nova Lab. Innovation Lab, or Nova Lab for short, is a class based on the work of Don Wetrick, an educator out of Noblesville, Indiana, and his book, Pure Genius. But the class was a response to this primary question. What would our education system look like if it focused on helping students develop purpose, a healthy sense of self, and a vision for their lives. So I thought about that, and I wrote up a syllabus for this class. And uh, I gave it out to the students at the end of August, right before school started, and I'm like, thank you for being pioneers. Here's the syllabus, all seven pages of it. And then about two weeks uh, into class, the students asked me, Mr. Height, um, is there like, a syllabus for class and it occurred to me that nobody wants to read a seven page syllabus slash manifesto. Uh, so I went home and I decided to draw a roadmap for where we are and where we were going. And uh, this is the roadmap and I'm sure it surprised some of them because they were expecting something a little more linear perhaps. But the deal is this, everything up top on this map is just a whole lot of wandering around and looking at things like um, having chats with people from different uh, walks of life, um, watching YouTube videos, uh, going on field trips, and just looping around and coming back and finding dead ends. But eventually we got to the bottom where the students were able to set off on their own projects. And the students really enjoyed it because they got to ask a whole lot of questions, even questions about why they were even in the class. Um, but then we also went on field trips. And here we're working with this gentleman in the middle is Duncan Wardell, who used to be the head of innovation for the entire Disney Corporation. Uh, we played lots of games like Disruptus, which is a design-centered game. We did presentation after presentation of things that we were working on just to get our head into the space of creating and talking about the things that we created. And we pushed out into the world and visited people in their places of work. Here is Bill Corbett, owner of Corbett um, Interior Design and Furniture Company. And so what came of all this work? Well, I have three really solid examples out of last year's Nova Lab. And Remember, last year was cut short. So these are projects that students worked on in earnest for about three months. The first is Living Now. This is done by a group of three boys and, and one girl. And their primary focus, what they, their purpose in this purpose project, was to help get their friends off of these things and out into the real world. So they designed a business plan. They came up with a logo. They designed uh, t-shirts and sweatshirts. They sold them. They took their friends out, they made videos, they put videos up on a YouTube channel, and they were able to donate $1,000 to the Appalachian Trail uh, Fund. Another group was called Stomping Grounds. These gentlemen here wanted to host a music festival in our town of Collegeville. And uh, they did that by working with Ursinus College and um, Ursinus was running a festival at around the same time. And so they were able to co-brand and get funding from Ursinus for their own substage in the main music festival. And finally, this group of uh, young students, their purpose of their project was to get 100% of all high school seniors who would be eligible to vote in the latest election registered to vote in time. All three of those projects were phenomenally successful, although Stomping Grounds never got off the ground because the festival had been pushed back because of the pandemic. So I wanna come back to the original question of how might we design learning spaces where students can pursue their own interests in deep time supported by a minimum viable career. Curriculum. I really think there's several answers to this, but let me just review here. First, we need to reframe time to open up the curriculum to take our focus off of 
just looking at how do we most efficiently get to the end. We need to find what are the most important parts of that curriculum to perhaps, as Jal Mehta and Shanna Peebles called it, Marie Kondo, our curriculums. Um, we need to alter the focus so that our questions are focused more on learners and less on the things that we need to achieve. And if we do this, I think we, we ought to be grounding all that we do in a simple philosophy of teaching and learning. And this is mine, which I created in 1997. When we trust our students, empower them to take charge of their learning and offer the necessary guidance, they will astound us. I've been teaching for, this is my 28th year now. I've been astounded every single year. But you know, I think there's one other thing that we need to do. And we have to get away from this notion of right and wrong answers to everything. And we need to spend time partnering with uncertainty and confusion, swimming around in questions rather than constantly rushing for answers. We have to build that negative capability that Keats talked about, but we have to build it in ourselves first because if our students don't see that comfort with these areas of uncertainty and mysteries and doubts. If they don't see that in us, they'll never be comfortable there by themselves. But lastly, I think one thing is, you know, we want students to linger. This is the great joy of, che of teaching, I think, is when at the end of class, the student is still sticking around, talking endlessly about how deeply moved they are by whatever it is they're learning and how it's affecting their lives. And in addition to the points that I've noticed in the previous slide, I think we also have to consider the physical space itself and how we might design that space uh, to create what Professor Paul McCallick has recently called sacred learning spaces. He says, in learning spaces where rules, protocols, and prescribed curriculum is the norm, students adapt their intellectual and personal behavior to align with teachers' notions of right actions and right thinking. And they do that in exchange for a good grade. In such classrooms, the emphasis is on behavior rather than learning. So when the course is finished, the grade is given, and there's little need to retain knowledge. Um, and this is schooling, or learning is a transactional event. What I have done, what I am urging you to do, is to co-design with your students classes, curricula, and spaces for inspiration, aspiration, respiration, and creation, because all of these speak to learning as a transcendent event, all of them absolutely necessary for human motivation, but they are absolutely, wondrously inefficient. Thank you. Thanks so much, Garrett, that was great. Um, so I know that we're gonna have plenty of questions very quickly, um, so we'll be going to Randy Blank and Carrie Ann Power as they facilitate questions using the chat window. Um, I encourage both our guests, Gareth, and the rest of the studio chat facilitators to contribute their expertise to this discussion, and so take it away, Carrie Ann and Randy. Oh, I see something in the chat, chat window right here that I'm going to read to you, Gareth, okay? <laughs> yeah, I can see okay, it too, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. You remind me of a favorite quote, but that, but that night, Roger and I, I sat there transfixed by these sounds, and then without a word between us, we slipped on our jackets and we set out into the night to discover just what was out there. Our passport was a flashlight and our visa, a suddenly wakened curiosity about those insect voices which we had heard and yet not heard all our lives. A child's world is fresh, it's new, it's beautiful, it's, it's full of wonder and excitement. It's our misfortune that, for most of us, that clear-eyed vision, that true instinct for what is beautiful and awe-inspiring is dimmed, even lost before we reach adulthood. Rachel Carson, that is beautiful. Um, those of you that are, that are with us, joining us, if you have any questions regarding um, how Gareth uses design thinking in the classroom with his students, his programs. Go ahead and enter those in the chat box and, and either Randy or I will read them out loud and, and pose them for the good of the group. Uh, Linda writes that um, amazing presentation. 
Uh, Julia has a question. She Thank you. Would like, yeah, thanks. She would like some tips on how yeah. to get colleagues or administration to get on board. Good question. So, yeah, that is a good question, Julia. Um, I mean, I, I will tell you this. Uh, one of the things that I did, and I just I pulled it up and I gave it to uh, Doris, and Doris, you can put that into the resource page. Um, I went back to 2016, and I found my original proposal for the class uh, because I was um, I, I recognized that there was something missing from the high school when I moved from the middle school and that students seemed to be in an unhealthy environment um, simply following what everyone was telling them uh, what I, I, I did um, Julia was um, well I don't know how to I guess uh, when I get possessed with an idea um, I don't let go, and I, I'm very good at um, pushing people to uh, take a look at and ask questions. So I think the first thing to do is to really get a list of questions about what's going on and, and why it's going on. Like, so like start with why are things the way they are, right? Like it's a question that too many people never really ask about their situation. It is, as I mentioned in my talk, well, this is just the way things are. Right, we, we, have to, we have to be willing to ask that question. So, you know, frame it around why are things the way they are. Um, I'm sure I also um, did a lot of research on schools and places that were moving in these kind of directions. And I also had the background of years of my work in middle school, which I talked about, um, and how that could facilitate the kind of learning that we're looking for. But really, I mean, why not go and look at things like what does the World Economic Forum say are the top skills that are necessary for people in the coming, you know, in the, in the year 2030 or something like that, right? They just put out this, they call it the fourth industrial revolution, right? And they've got a list of skills. If you look at those skills, they're not the skills that are primary in most of the core classes right? You have to have at least one space during the day where students can be inspired, where they can aspire, where they can breathe, and where they can create because creation is one of the key skills that the workforce is looking for. You know, machine learning will be able to take over a ton of what human beings already do, but we don't think that they're going to get any, machines are going to get anywhere close to the kind of creative, um, you know, random connectivity that the human brain can, uh, create uh, anytime soon. So I would also look at that. And, and you're right. I love that, you know, you're giving them that space and time to ask questions. You know, here we want our students to be able to ask questions, yet we rarely give them that space and time to do that. Um, and so a great question was asked regarding how, how have you adapted um, what you do to online learning. Hmm. Yeah, so um, what, so this get, I, and as I was reading it, I realized, geez, that's a, another talk I should be thinking about. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that is that the class, if you look at that tagline, which comes from my class, a space for inspiration, aspiration, respiration, and creation. The purpose of that is really to recognize that you know, within architecture, and I'm sure Andrew probably knows this term, um, there's a phrase called third places, right? They are not our places of work or school. They are not our homes. They are these interstitial spaces where we can feel somewhat in a, a homey environment, but we can also do work. So your coffee shops, your bars, your restaurants, places that people often visit and where you know they can sort of be themselves outside of their own, their primary personal or professional spaces. And so I saw this um, Twitter feed from David Jakes and he's like, what would a virtual third space look like? And I thought about, geez, is that something that I could create with my students? And it is something that I am gonna actually be um, throwing out to them in terms of exploring those ideas. But I think that the, the key answer to the question is, the way to adapt to a virtual space like this is that I have given my entire first month, almost a month and a half over to community building, right? Like this kind of class only works if the students are willing to work with each other and to know each other at really deep levels. So 
everything we're doing in this first month, month and a half has been about getting to know each other, um, being put in random situations, doing improv activities, um, uh, working with something called Project Wayfinder, which is a curriculum that um, I've been lucky enough to get grants for for two years in a row, uh, which is all about purpose-driven learning and asking really four main questions for the students. Who am I? Who are we? What matters to me? What am I going to do about it? Um, so, you know, the, the adaptation to actually getting into the projects hasn't necessarily happened yet, but the pre-work has been done. And I appreciate the question because it's, it's absolutely crucial. When you're not there and, and able to powwow with each other every day, how does that work out um, online? I mean, without Zoom, I don't think the class exists, so. Hey, let's jump uh, to, um, I'm sorry, Gloria's question. She says, also as a writer, what are your materials of tools and journaling used as strategies to explore uh, example, poetry, brainstorming, collaboration during the active learning process. Yeah, well, so uh, absolutely poetry. I mean, um, I think if, if there's an aesthetic um, for me uh, in terms of like a philosophy of beauty uh, that I live by, it would be couched within poetry. Um, because what I, what I found in poetry during my life is that each poem is sort of like a small classroom and I'm able to learn things from um, each poem about how to look at the world, how to understand people, um, about history itself, about words themselves and how words um, can mean things within different contexts. So yeah, I definitely use poetry. Um, brainstorming, yes. Um, you know, collaboration. I mean, I would say, Gloria, that's a, that's a great question for my English classes. Um, I don't do as much writing with uh, Nova Lab classes, but when we do, uh, the writing is always reflective in nature. I'm, um, and rarely is it sort of like of the, uh, the hard uh, five paragraph essay. And I shouldn't say rarely, it is never of that type. <laughs> okay, so we do blogging, um, we do weekly um, reflections or three to one videos where students talk about where three things that you accomplished this week, two regrets you have, and what's one thing you would tell your future self 20 years down the road. And we're gonna be keeping like those kind of journals, video journals. Oh, I love that. That's a, I did too. Um, we're, Andrew's asking a really great question regarding your, the failures. <laughs> I don't know if you read that one, thinking of terms of prototyping. Oh, yeah. thing, what didn't work? What were the failures? What did you learn from them? Um, how did you? Yeah. Um, so what were the failures? Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> I could be flipping Andrew and say, well, I have totally, there were no failures last year. Um, I do remember student failures, right? But the thing with the student failures is that we always talk about this and, and Andrew, you probably know this. And, and I think all art teachers know this, that, you know, failure is never an end state. It's just, you've discovered something that didn't work, right? So it's a learning opportunity. And I had students who worked for like a month, a month and a half on projects and they would come to me and they would say, you know what, Mr. Wright, I just like, I don't think I want to keep, I don't want to do this anymore. And really, if, this, if I'm honoring what the space is created for, inspiration, aspiration, respiration, and creation, and it's their time and their space, I can't say, no, you have to stay with that project. So I created these, uh, they had to do an end presentation, and I called them a stick a fork in me, I'm done project um, presentation. And they literally had to say, look, here's what, I here's what I started on. Here's what all you guys have seen me be working on but here's the obstacle I hit that I either just don't want to try and get past, couldn't get past, or decided, you know what, I think there's something else I want to do. Um, and I had students who did those presentations and, you know, at the end we're all just like, that was so good. You know, it's just, it's okay to talk about those end states. And for me, in terms of prototyping the class, um, I think there came a point in time where I assumed that I could get away with too much because I wasn't allowed to go on certain field trips because I didn't turn things in on time. And I guess one of the things I learned is that I, I can't get around every single um, uh, requirement and, and dotting all the I's and the T's, Andrew. I don't know if that's a cop out, but there we go. <laughs> 
w wouldn't you agree that sometimes we learn more from our failures right and and yeah. such it gives it such a great moment honestly to kind of celebrate failure sometimes those things you're more successful in your learning by being able to show those failures and yes. seldom do we celebrate that you know in education like you're like you said i mean kids are given a favorable response if if they're you know delivering the information you want to hear basically yeah so yeah uh linda yeah, has a all, question it's all about compliance yeah yeah linda from chicago okay. uh has a question about um how can teacher education support new teachers to invest in learning the way you invest exploration experimentation and discovery with your students it's a big question yeah um i mean linda i've thought about that question for a long time my my relationship with you know um design ed and um other uh doris's design learning um network i, I mean uh, we always talk about okay if this is going to work in other classrooms we've got to get it into teacher education so how do we do that um i i think uh you know, I, I think we have to give those students time as well, right? That uh, colleges are often, you know, those curriculum are, are packed as well, and you've got to get to all these things, and you have your finals at the end. I think colleges, and I know that they are, many of them are, are starting to look at different ways to um, assess. Like, I hesitate to say measure, because anytime we measure something, we fix it in place. And I don't think that this kind of a mindset is something that ought to be um, thought of as fixed, right? Uh, it has to be fluid. It has to be something that is uh, changeable and adaptable, right? The adaptable mind. Um, so I think we have to offer um, uh, teachers um, a freedom as well. I think, I, you know, I did not go through teacher education. I did English and then I took a summer long sprint to get a, um, an intern certificate so I could actually teach. And then I made up whatever, whatever work I needed to make up for pedagogy in a master's program. So it was on the back end, but I was already a teacher before I even got all that other kind of stuff. So I guess, um, you know, give, Give, give people a little more um, freedom, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good answer. I, I think, you know, the other thing is that you, people have, you have to read. I mean, that's my English teacher answer, right? But there's no point in my day where I'm not reading and trying to find out something new or who's doing what or, you know, I, I guess another really good answer, Linda, and then I'll stop answering you with all these answers, is um, get, uh, student teachers to join as many personal learning networks as they can. Twitter for me was an explosion. Once I got on Twitter and I met all these people who were doing design thinking all around the world, um, it was amazing. And so I think they need to know that, you know, their way of thinking, is, they're not the only ones in the world. Gareth? Um, yes. Very short, because we, we um, we're almost yep. done, but tell people why the counselors was so important to flip oh, yeah. the students from being in an old mindset of how classes are supposed to be run and how yours, they, they, they just didn't understand the concept. So people weren't signing yeah. up, but the counselors were key. So I just yeah. gave you away. But yeah. So no that's, that, no, that's fine. I think, you know, like, look, I don't think that every teacher should be teaching this way. I think, I think it would be great, but that would be like a democratic school. And I'm not looking to turn all public schools into democratic free schools or something like that. But I do think there needs to be time in a student's day every day for them to enter into these kind of spaces. Um, and what I did is I just started, I looked at the way we were teaching students. And then I said to myself, you know, all these teachers are talking about, well, when you get to college, this is how it is. And I looked and I'm like, when was the last time these teachers actually were in college, like a four year college, right? It's a long time ago. 
And what I what I know from reading, and I'm you know like I'm reading admissions counselors, I'm reading about um, you know these kind of these kind of design thinking programs popping up in colleges all around the place. I'm reading about Harvard and um, their Courage to Care program, and uh, and I'm saying I don't think our teachers. I think we're thinking in antiquated ways about what students actually need. And so I just started. I said to the counselors, I'm like, look. I started plugging them and saying, I think, you know, look, look at what is, is being asked and what we're giving, because there's a total disconnect. And so I just started, every time I found something, I emailed it to every counselor and I said, I'm going to be creating a class and this is what the class is about. It is focused on these kind of things. And, you know, it's, it's Genesis was my work in middle school in creativity and, and design and why that's so important. And, you know, that's all borne out now. It's, it's all at the top of the skills that, that we're looking for. And yet here we are, we're creating, you know, students who are very good at, at plugging numbers into algorithms, which a calculator can do. So, you know, wh how are we giving them anything that is going to make them marketable? How are we giving them anything that is, you know, um, going to make them competitive, right? Every single student in, that, uh, that I teach in my gifted classes, they're all taking two, three, four APs, some of them taking five APs a year, right? That's great. But if they're gonna to go to a top college, there's a huge pile of students who have also done that. What they need is some way to say, yeah, here's what I know because of the, the psychometrics that say I've gotten the 1600 or whatever it is now on the SAT. But here's what differentiates me from that pile because here's what I can do with what I know. I mean, that girl who founded Make It 100, right? She's at Penn now. And she said that when she was interviewing for a lot of different colleges, she's like, Mr. Height, I think they, I think they wanna know more about your class than they wanna know about me, right? And like, that's, that's, a, that's huge because what they recognize is that there's something that this student was involved in that was unique and um, meaningful to them, right? So it becomes a sales point for the student as well. We have so uh, many more questions, Doris, but I, yeah, go ahead, Carrie Ann. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask Doris if she wanted to um, elaborate on what you just put in the chat. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So there's several things to share with you. The first one is an example of what a resource page looks like after the chat. It's of Diane, who was just last month's um, presenter. So Gareth um, is wonderful about sending me um, things to put in his resource page. Yeah. So he and I will settle up sometime soon and then I'll post okay. one just like his. So when you go to the DIG website, right, on the left hand column will be a listing of the resource pages for each of the presenters. Now I'm, I'm kind of waylaid on the, the, I think the first three chats, but Diane's is up, the one previous to that, and we'll get Gareth's ups up um, and then um, hopefully sometime soon I'll, I can get the YouTube video um, thing working for DIG and then we'll actually have this recorded session up as well. So certainly slide deck, slide decks now, um, but eventually we'll have the recorded videos. So beyond that, what I wanted to share was that um, Gareth and I <clears throat> worked a bit on three different challenges, little mini challenges that can be as a, a bridge between what he just shared and what you might want to experience with your students in your classrooms. So um, Gareth, before I go into that, I'm going to share a screen of the, the yep. mm -hmm. challenges. Tell us about Cannonball Run before I start. Uh, okay. <laughs> Quickly. So, all right. So, yeah, like one of the things that I do is whenever I'm reading, I'm always thinking about, well, how could I use this in the classroom? And sometimes I'll be reading and somebody has already thought of that. And so um, I belong to a group called Education Reimagined, uh, which is a great, you know, forward thinking consortium looking to do exactly that. And uh, the, the guy, um, Paul, put out a, a reference to an article in GQ about the cannonball run. And if you are of a certain age, like my age, and I'm in my 50s, uh, you might remember back in the early uh, 80s, there were a series of movies, two or three of them with Burt Reynolds and Sally Field and somebody else. And it wasn't the Smokey and the Bandits, but it was uh, the Cannonball Run movies. And what it was about was about a real 
race across America to see who could get in their car and drive the fastest from a, a certain point in New York City to a certain hotel, the Portofino Hotel in California. Um, and the movies turned it into this spoof, but it's a real thing. And um, the, the, I think the record was 27 hours and nobody thought that it would ever be broken. But when COVID hit, um, uh, one guy realized that, hey, all the highways are going to be wide open because nobody's traveling. So he tricked out uh, a Ford Mustang. He put gas tanks in all the passenger seats in the car. And he made it in like 26 hours or something like that. And the link to education is this. Like this pandemic has taught us, and I talk a little bit about this in my, in my speech, uh, that we need to open up the, the, the freeways of our curriculum because there's just too much stuff on there. And if we do, it's not about how fast can we get somewhere, but it's about the freedom that students have to travel from one point to another and to explore you know, the, the vast swath of, of knowledge that is laid out before them. So Doris uh, has come up with a, um, did you share the screen? Um, yeah, Siddhi, can you, whoops, where'd she go? Right here. Randy, maybe you can do it. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, oh, I can share the screen. It says you've got yeah. a host. Yeah. Yes. Oh boy. Oh no. Hosted. Dis I'm. Hmm. I dis I'm disabled. All right. I'll fix you. Oh, there it was. Right. That was it. Isn't Isn't that it? No. That was, Host that was me. Participant screen sharing. Huh. I might be able to do it, Doris. Hold on. Let me see. Well, I'll host again. No, I'm good. I'm good. All right. Um. Yep. This it's is. Dead. Yeah, I think I just did it. No, um, come on, you no? got an old one, honey. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop, go ahead. There you go. All right, so are you seeing it? Yes. Okay, so um, let me get this out of the way. No. There we go. All right, so what we have is, the first one has to do with the cannonball run. Um, that Gareth was just talking about. And I took a slice of the concept and created um, a focused mini challenge that, that just has one learning strategy. So this is something that you could do over the course of a few sessions or maybe one, depending on your students and where they're at. And, you know, this can be scaled for lower grade students or um, even, you know, beyond if a high school if that's that's needed. So the purpose of the challenge is to um, to create this opportunity of making sense of the pandemic through a different lens. Um, and that's consistent with with some of the things that Gareth has been saying tonight. And we're looking at the, the investigating the impact that it, the COVID-19 has had on high speed transportation and ways to make the world a better place. So the problem set so those were the intended, intended outcomes. The problem set is that we have, well, um, we have <laughs> the, this, this wonderful opportunity of making sense of building on this congestion-free pathway. So the essential question is transforming the past forms into something constructive and innovative. And there's a, a learning strategy that I, I use um, with little people all the way up to big um, called Hopes and Fears. I got this um, from a good friend at Carnegie Mellon. <clears throat> and it's a way of emotionally connecting with the problem set. So you're looking at your short and your long-term hopes and fears um, having to do with that problem set. So you're having to think, you're having to process what it actually means so you can connect and articulate your, your um, emotional responses to that. And then taking the fears one step further is um, you take those fears, turn them around into positives. So then you come up with all of these wonderful, unique ideas and, and um, innovative thoughts that you wouldn't normally have. So these other, um, two, uh, briefly, because we're already out of time, um, Access, accessible lighting pathways to visualize other, within otherwise dark spaces. And we're looking at the human condition here. So the learning stra strategy is having to do with the habits of mind of how we interact and um, 
and our sense of safety, what happens when we access a, a space that's dark, right? And then the last one is having to do with water, um, when it's too much or when it's too little, and how do farmers navigate that as, as, a, as a setting. Um, so there is another, um, I don't know if I put it into the chat window or not. Um, you, can, you know, Doris, can I just jump in real quick? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, I think one thing to say about all of these is that on face, they seem really daunting, right? But let's remember that the first step in design thinking is, you know, obviously we're building empathy for whoever our users are, but we're also at the same time diving in and doing a good deal of background research and trying to really figure out what the, what the space is and, and what the impacts are. So, you know, you can, you can scale that up or scale that down depending upon the, um, uh, the audience that you're working with, who are your students, right? So, I mean, you can make these as big or as, as, as quick as, as they need to be uh, based upon the attention span and how far you wanna go. Exactly, that's exactly right. And I, I believe in your chat window, you'll see another link having to do with the funding of, uh, for supplies and materials that you need for these kind of challenges. And within the design interest group, we've created grants to support that. And um, they're now on a rolling basis, so you could submit a, a proposal at any time during the year. Um, it used to be a year-to-year -year kind of um, bookend thing. So we've, we've tried to make it more flexible and um, more accessible, especially during this pandemic. So beyond that, um, I do want to share um, a couple other links having to do with Kirsten's um, talk that is going to be on December 1st. And um, let's see, I'll stop sharing this. And maybe maybe Kirsten our... could wave to us so we can all say hello. Mostly. I, I should stop sharing if, <laughs> if we want to do that. Okay, Kirsten, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, good, she waved. Hi. <laughs> okay. Hi everyone. <laughs> Okay, so um, Kirsten see. will be talking about um, sketch noting, noting when she comes with us on December 1st. Should be right. And we're, it's going to be a workshop type um, setup where the first 10 minutes she'll introduce um, the exercise that we're going to, to experience in sketch noting. And then we are actually going to have a good chunk of time to actually interact and, and to do um, hands on work. And then um, the last 10 minutes, we'll be um, kind of unpacking that and asking more questions. And um, Kirsten also has some really great resources that she'll be sharing. So I think in a nutshell, uh, the best way uh, to describe it is I'm going to quickly go into basically the science of how sketch notes will help uh, not just you uh, or not just your students. It's, it's a great skill set uh, kind of across the board. Go a little bit into that, but the workshop that um, I'd like, I'd love for you, for everyone to be able to participate in. It's one that you're going to be able to recreate in your classroom. So it's immediately usable. Very good. There's a lot of great research that has come out about how much more impactful sketch learning is compared to taking regular notes or and especially more so than just doodling so i'm anxious and excited to be seeing that next month randy i'm thinking that um could we include these links in your follow-up um survey absolutely question? you got it and then that way people it's kind of it's a either you see it or you don't in the chat window so this will that'll really help and i'm going to jump on that to say that that our ending thoughts to because we're five minutes over um, we would really love for you to provide us your feedback in our five question survey that comes um, to you via uh, Randy uh, one of those questions allows you to request a certificate of completion for having attended this session and as they've just said we'll include the links that um, would become probably of great interest to each of you um, if you'd like to re reference this recorded studio chat or share it with your friends, you can find the link on the Design Interest Group website. The URL can also be found in the chat window. I usually can. Um, we want to invite you to return next first 
uh, Tuesday of the month where we get to hear Kirsten's uh, discussion on sketch noting. And we want you to remember that the Studio Chat series celebrates diversity in all things, spaces, and experiences through design. Good night. <laughs> so if, are we going to continue the conversation if people are? Anyone who'd like to is welcome. OK. I will unmute microphones. Great presentation, Gareth. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Good to see you. Good to see you, man. When is, uh, next time you're in Philly, I got to show you my new.